Hi, I'm Bill Trattler, and I'm from Miami, Florida. Well, the reason I come to ESCRS, and of course it's wonderful we're here in Barcelona, is there's so many new technologies that are available here in Europe that aren't available in the United States. And I, I feel I learned so much about what is coming in the future and what I can maybe bring back to my practice even now. Uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting was uh, John Canalopoulos uh, shared some of his uh, uh, interest in this technology called platelet-rich protein, which is basically like autologous serum, but it's a new way of making the autologous serum, it's called PRP. And basically it really helps uh, speed up epithelial healing. And Dr. Kenilopoulos shared that he's been using it for his patients that are undergoing uh, complicated uh, laser, surface laser uh, treatments, such as cross-linking combined with, with turbo-guided PRK, and how it helps speed epithelial healing, and really makes an impact for patients, both for getting faster visual recovery and less dry eye postoperatively. So that's an exciting technology I'm interested in. And the other technology that Dr. Kenilop has shared with me that's really made an impact for his practice and seems really exciting for me is being able to look at uh, epithelial maps. So he uses an OCT technology made by OptiView where he looks at the epithelial map, uh, epithelial thickness profiles. And he actually uses it not only for the diagnosis of keratoconus, but also to, to identify dry patients and follow dry patient therapies and see how they do. So I thought those two technologies, both PRP and epithelial thickness mapping, are two exciting things I've learned here at the, at the show. Well, PRP, um, Dr. Kenilopoulos shared, he, he makes it up himself in, uh, at his center, at his hospital, they actually created it. It's something that in the United States we could start doing you know, through compounding pharmacies, but there is a company that's developed a, a kit that that's available um, for orthopedic surgeons and other specialties, but not for ophthalmology yet, which makes it very easy for the, uh, for the doctor to basically do that in their own office. Because one of the challenges for autologous serum now is I have to get patients to get their blood drawn, send it to a lab, and the lab prepares it. And this, this will be a kit or technology that we can actually do in the office and really make it easy for patients to have this te technology because it does make such an impact for patients. So for me, um, you know, OCT is you know obviously a mainstay of the technologies that really make a difference uh, as clinicians. We you know we use OCT for the retina, and obviously having the technology available for for cornea work is really you know game changing. It really lets us look at uh, new new things. And and so what what I've seen so far is that the OptiView seems to be very uh, effective at helping us uh, understand the corneal shape and corneal thickness as well as the epithelial mapping profile. So I think OptiView is one of the leaders um, in uh, this technology here, but I am hoping, uh, and I'm sure it's not too far away, that the other uh, great companies such as Heidelberg um, it, you know, and others will be able to come out with similar type of mapping software. It's a great question. Prior to every laser refractive surgery, we always perform topography. But it's not always the case with cataract surgery. I have many colleagues, um, both in the US and abroad, that, that view topography only for special situations. Patients have had previous LASIK um, or other situations where they, where they may order topography, or if they're gonna have a, a premium lens, like a multifocal lens or a toric lens, but it's not a routine test. And I do think that topography for every patient undergoing cataract surgery should be considered a, a routine step because you can learn so much about the patient and also identify conditions that the patient needs to know about before surgery so you can better prepare them for what to expect after cataract surgery. And so if, when we look at the slit lamp exam, we're not gonna see the slit lamp, slit lamp exam look completely normal, but topography can show irregularity and that will result in the patient having less quality of vision postoperatively. And if you identify this ahead of time, you can talk to the patient and set expectations properly so they're happy with the result rather than figuring this out later and having patients less happy. Well, thank you so much for bringing up epithelion cross-linking. Um, obviously, um, all clinicians would love to be able to perform epithelion cross-linking because it provides uh, very fast visual recovery and much less risk than the traditional Dresden protocol or epi-off. Um, however, the results in Europe and some studies have shown that 
uh, EpiOn does not appear to be as effective as EpiOff. And while I definitely respect the clinicians who've been involved in the studies, uh, some of the things we're doing at our center and in the, a study that we're running in the United States is different than what was done in the studies that are published in the peer-reviewed literature. And we are looking to get our data published. Uh, but, but some of the things that uh, make a difference for EpiOn and why we've been successful with it um, is first is the loading. So we, we, we're working with the riboflavin that within 30 minutes, the, the cornea is completely loaded uh, with just a special drop that's been developed. Um, it's helped, it was developed by uh, Dr. Roy Rubenfeld and, and others. They helped put together the, 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 uh, the intellectual property behind it, but it's a drop that's very effective for loading. Riclin? Oh, no, it's not Riclin. It's not available. So it's, a, it's an eye drop that's um, not available in Europe. It's not commercially available. Okay. It's in development. There is an a interest in getting it made commercially, but it's not uh, available yet. Okay. So we've had access to a special riboflavin drop that allows for very fast, rapid uh, absorption uh, into the cornea. And... The key step for clinicians who are doing, want to do Epion is to ensure that the cornea is completely loaded with riboflavin and you want the stroma to be loaded. Um, and so that's the first step is um, having plenty of riboflavin in the cornea. Um, the next thing you want to make sure is that you do not want to have riboflavin in the epithelium because if there's riboflavin in the epithelium, when the UV light hits the epithelium, it gets, the interaction occurs and not as much UV gets into the stroma where you want it. So after loading, we also rinse the eye and we work to get the epithelium clear of riboflavin. And also we don't want riboflavin in the tear film. So once we've loaded a cornea, we do not add additional riboflavin at all during the, during the UV light ad administration. And so that's a, a key step. The other thing we did is we actually bumped up the power of our, our light energy. So um, we know that the epithelium itself can absorb some UV. So the traditional treatment was 3 milliwatts for 30 minutes, and we just bumped ours up to about 4 milliwatts for 30 minutes. And one final thing is, the, another key is oxygen. So we need plenty of oxygen in, into the system to make these, this procedure effective. And so we are w working with fractionation where the light turns on and off in a cyclical way. And when the light is off, oxygen can enter in through the epithelium uh, into the stroma, and then we can actually get a nice reaction. So those are some of the steps that, that, that the technology we're working with seems to be very effective in. That's why I've exclusively been performing epion crosslinking for the last five years. Yeah, that's a great question. So the nice thing about Epion uh, crosslinking is that it's a very fast visual recovery, but that evening, patients can be very uncomfortable. So first of all, uh, in the management, we still want to take care of pain. So we give patients uh, topical dilute anesthetics to help with pain, some oral medications. And just getting through the first night uh, can be a little rough, and I, I would have thought that Epion would be less painful than Epi off in the first 24 hours, and I don't think that's the case. I think they're both uncomfortable the first, you know, first really 12 hours. But then with Epion by 12 to... 12 hours or so, you're starting to feel a lot better. Uh, and most patients by the next day are able to uh, function normally with just a little photosensitivity. Um, and then postoperatively, we still want to use an antibiotic to pr protect against infection. We, we use topical steroids for inflammation. And another really important area is that ocular surface disease, dry is so prevalent, prevalent in these patients who have keratoconus or post lasik ectasia. So we always want to work hard to manage the ocular surface, whether it's punctal plugs, topical cyclosporin, or other, or lid hygiene, uh, it's really important to pay attention to, the, to that area. And that's a you know, really uh, interesting and actually a challenging situation at times as well. First of all, while we think that keratoconus is relatively rare, when you start looking at your patients who are coming in for cataract surgery, you actually realize that it's actually a little more common than you might think. And so I typically uh, find about one of every 50 to 100 patients has either a mild, like form fruits keratoconus or early keratoconus or uh, more moderate or severe keratoconus. And we first we perform topography on every patient coming in for cataract surgery because if you look at the slit lamp exam for a patient who comes in for cataract surgery, there's no evidence of keratoconus or early keratoconus. Uh, but if you look at their maps, they may have it. So you don't want to miss that uh, ahead of time. So the first is identification. And again, um, one of the challenges we have with patients who are coming in for cataract surgery is dry eye is so common, and so ocular surface disease. So identifying ocular surface disease early, treating uh, the condition, and then we bring patients back for repeat testing. We find that the, the initial maps of the, the measuring the, the corneal shape, the keratometry, and the, we use IO Master, um, the readings can be close but not perfect. And if we optimize the ocular surface, not only in our regular cataract surgery patients, but specifically the patients with 
earlier moder keratoconus, we can really get improved readings, which will put us a little bit closer to being on target uh, for, with our IOL calculations. Uh, the next step I typically like to do is, we I do talk to patients about the possible need for cross-linking in the future, so I typically will target a little more myopia, so that if we do decide to offer cross-linking in the future, um, and there is sometimes a hyperopic shift after uh, cross-linking, that we're, we're in a good space. So I typically target about minus one and then uh, during surgery, you know, we want to be, uh, we want to manage the ocular surface well. And uh, typically, the, the cases go very, very nicely. Um, you know, with cataract surgery, it's really just really the, the planning ahead of time as well as the postoperative care. So genetic testing for keratoconus would be just a wonderful. Um, wonderful technology if it was available, and there is a company now working towards that. I'm sure there's multiple area, multiple companies that are aware of one in particular um, that's working hard to collecting genetic samples of patients with keratoconus and try to systematically go through the genetic information to come up with a genetic test. Um, and I, you know, I do think that would be exciting if we can be able to provide that and, and help identify it early on, so we can help you know, help our patients who may have show some early signs and help confirm that they do indeed have the disease and there's, there's, since there are therapies available, they can start therapy early. Identifying dry, you would think would be really easy. You know, it should be, you know, you look and, but it actually can be a little harder than, than people may think. So first of all, um, you, most people think that you can just ask patients, are, are you comfortable? Do you have eye discomfort? But what's, what's surprising is that most patients who are in their 60s and 70s who have ocular surface disease do not complain of ocular irritation. Their biggest symptom is actually visual fluctuation or vision issues. And that's why they're coming to see you. They're not seeing well. And they think it's the cataract. You may think it's the cataract, but in reality, it's the ocular surface disease is contributing to the blurred vision. So history is not as helpful as you may think. But on, on exam, I do like to use fluorescein and look at both tear breakup time, as well as the staining of the cornea. And I find that with those two tests, as well as just looking at the, uh, the tear meniscus layer, the level, it's, you can, you know, that's also very useful, as well as the eyelids themselves, you know, the lid margin. Is there my bowman gland dysfunction or blepharitis present? And with those tests alone, I usually am pretty accurate at, at identifying it ahead of time. I also, of course, perform topography on every patient, as well as IOL master. And you can look at the tests and, and determine if they were good tests or if the patient had an unstable tear film during the test where the, and the results won't be as reliable. Because that's really important as well is you wanna make sure the tests are accurate. And if they have an unstable tear film, you're gonna get less reliability um, in the testing results. Yeah, I find that just, you know, you know just uh, discussing with the patient just a little tiny bit, um, you know, about why they're there to see me, which is because they're not seeing well, and then really looking is, is for me been proven to be very effective. I agree that questionnaires like the OSDI um, and some of the, the shorter surveys can be helpful, but the OSDI um, has 12 questions. Six of the 12 questions are actually vision questions. How well do you see, right? And they're coming in, they have cataracts. So, so OSDI can actually be off because of cataracts as well. Uh, although it's nicely correlated to dry in general, cataracts will impact the uh, OSD reliability. So that's why I find that it's not, you know, I, I can just talk to the patient, really look and, and, and find it successful. That's just a fantastic question. We do see those patients and it, you know, one, my, one thing I, we think of and people have mentioned is that it's probably the nerves are just extra sensitive. And so there's, for some reason, they're just a little bit more sensitive than normal. And I find that those patients, I still treat them like dry, even though I don't see corneal staining or a rapid tear film breakup time, I'll still use my typical dry therapies. I'll use uh, topical cyclosporin, a pulse of steroids, um, manage the lid and, and give them time. And sometimes that can help turn the corner. Um, other people have talked about using, you know, amniotic grafts, um, you know, like Procara is available in the US or other technologies to try to further just to enhance and, and help the health of the, of the uh, epithelium and the cornea itself. And I think that can be helpful typically, but you're right, there are some patients that can be really challenging to treat and they may have a more central you know, nervous system cause for their, for their discomfort. Well, I think we're really lucky right now that we do have many choices and, and some choices are the obvious choices. When we have drugs that become approved, it's like, oh wait, we definitely wanna, you know, we have cyclosporine available and, and I think it's gonna, you know, take, have a nice uptake, but there are lots of other therapies as well. 
on my end, first of all, when I see a patient with dry eye, I realize that, that today how they look, um, if I don't do anything, if I don't treat their underlying cause, if they come back in a year, they'll probably look a little bit worse. They may be the same, but they are unlikely to be better without therapy. And while lubricants are nice and they make people feel better, they don't really treat the underlying cause. We've been fortunate to have topical cyclosporin for over a decade in the US, and it's been, it really does help um, not only improve the, the signs and symptoms of dry eye, but we're also changing the patient's course of dry eye for the rest of their life by jumping in and treating them now. So it almost has a preventative effect too of you're, they're making them better, but they're also gonna be in a better stage and have less dry in the future. Um, Lefitograss is another medication uh, that Shire has uh, recently has acquired and will be hopefully uh, getting approved, we're hoping get approval in the U.S. so that there'll be more therapeutic options in the U.S. and hopefully that they'll also have a strategy for Europe because that'll be an additive type of technology. Um, but then there's so many other things as well. You know, um, there's oral omega-3s. There's, um, I've been also using a technology called, uh, it's made by a company called Nova Bay, but it's basically hypochlorous acid, um, you know, lid scrubs. And basically it's an antiseptic that kills the bacteria that are behind and, and, and causing some of the meibomian gland dysfunction. And in the past, I used oral doxycycline or topical azithromycin, but having an antiseptic that kills all bacteria seems to be working well for my patients as well. I do, and, and you know, treating patients earlier, you're gonna affect their time course. Um, I, I think it's a great analogy that you know, rheumatoid arthritis, you can make them feel better, but if you don't get to the underlying uh, process, they're gonna get worse over time. And dry eye is, you know, when we look at our patients, you look at 20-year-old patients and then we see some 20-year-olds with dry eyes, but you look at a, a cohort of patients in their 60s and 70s, many more have dry eye and more severe dry eye. And so getting uh, to the dry ocular surface disease early and treating it effectively with therapeutics that actually alter the course, I think will have a long-term impact for our patients, especially as we all live longer. Um, we really want to you know, help, help treat that area. Well, I think the biggest, the reason uh, patients uh, don't seek care is because when younger patients, especially computer users, um, they're often, you know, working the computer, they're getting, they get eye irritation, um, blurry vision, they do actually seek help. But then o over time, you start to say, think that's normal. And so I think patients feel that, you know, it's normal for them to have blurred vision as the day goes on. And the pain starts to also diminish. So that's why our older patients in their 60s and 70s are less likely to report pain issues and more likely to have blurred vision. And they, they often will think the blurred vision is due to other things or less important things, they don't come and seek treatment. So I think it's it's, Part of it's education, the patients don't realize they have the condition, and also adaptation, that they're used to this, what they have, and they feel that you know, that's how life is, and they don't seek treatment, and they don't, don't realize there are effective treatments available. You know, I, mean, I think that, you know, it's... The general medical doctor has so many things to talk to their patients about. It would be hard, it may be hard for them to bring up dry eyes and extra piece of information when they have to manage so many other issues that patients may have. So I, I do think this is still an, an, you know, an eye care issue. And so uh, optometry, opticians, um, you know, ophthalmologists, you know, eye care providers in general uh, should be the ones to try to educate their patients about it, but also identify it early rather than waiting till later on. But I think that you know, we have so many opportunities. When we're taking care of a patient, they all have family members. They have parents, they have brothers, sisters, children. And just if we tell one patient and say, listen, does your um, relative ha suffer from dry eyes too? You can certainly spread awareness that way. I and mean, just like we're doing for keratoconus, when patients with keratoconus come in and see me, the first thing I talk about is their family members. Does any of your family members possibly have keratoconus? And if so, you know, they may want to come in and get screening because there are therapies available to catch things early.